So once we've found people that are open to spiritual things, that have some interest in hearing about Christ, then the question, well, how do we actually communicate the gospel message? And uh, there's a lot of different methods to do this. There's a lot of different aspects of the gospel that one could choose to emphasize. Uh, some people are spoken to very strongly by the idea that I bear guilt for the things I've done wrong and that I need forgiveness for that guilt. Other people have maybe a less sense of a guilt, but they have a strong value of harmony and they know that somehow they're far from God. They want to be reconciled. They want to have peace with God. For some people, the idea of eternal life is a very strong attraction. I know of a person in Japan uh, whose mother-in-law, Japanese, the idea of eternal life was not very attractive to her because according to the Buddhist teaching, life is a life of suffering. So you don't want eternal suffering, but eternal peace, eternal peace. That was very attractive to her. And so uh, there are different aspects of the gospel that can be emphasized, all of them true, all of them important. And they offer different starting points in seeing that little opening in, the, in a person's heart where, where Christ can speak into it. But what are some of the more specific methods? Well, of course, we know about personal evangelism where just one-on-one, -on -one, I share the gospel with another person who I know. I maybe tell my story about what Jesus did in my life or how I became a Christian. Or I explain to them, maybe using a gospel track or a little drawing, an illustration of what the gospel is about. So that would be personal evangelism, and we should train all of our people to, at some level, be able to explain their faith to others. Then there's proclamation evangelism, and here we're thinking more of a, an event where there's a preacher or a speaker who is going to explain the gospel in a larger sort of setting. Of course, we think of campaign evangelism like, like Billy Graham campaigns or, or maybe even a church event where you have a special Sunday where you invite people to a special topic. And many churches have done this where they've had topics like um, how to have peace with God or um, you know, how to overcome challenges in life and then you relate the gospel to that topic and people who are interested in that topic are invited. Uh, so that would be forms of proclamation evangelism. I mentioned our tent evangelizations that we did in Germany because people would come to a tent. That was sort of a festive atmosphere and uh, we would have events in the tent. Evangelistic visitation is another option where you may go literally from door to door in a community. Um, in big cities, that can be pretty difficult because people are not always welcoming to open the door to a stranger in a big city. Um, but what can be effective is churches have had maybe children's ministries where a lot of uh, children from the community come whose parents are not related to the church. And then you may go and visit those parents of those children and say, we'd like to tell you about what this program is that your child attends. Parents say, well, yeah, my child's been going there. He's having fun. He likes it. Tell me about what that is. So that's an open door to be able to share with the parents the gospel. And that's been one way. Uh, or evangelistic visitation in hospitals where you're visiting somebody in a hospital and you offer to pray for them and you counsel with them. And they're in a critical life uh, transition there where they may be open to spiritual things. So these would be forms of evangelistic visitation. What's become popular uh, is a small group and seminar evangelism. Uh, many of us are familiar with just the evangelistic Bible study where you may have some friends, work colleagues, or in your neighborhood, and you say, hey, have you ever thought about just reading the Bible, just learning about the life of Jesus? And people say, no, I don't know much about the life of Jesus. I say, well, come on. Come on over to my house once a week. We'll, we'll read about the life of Jesus. And that becomes an evangelistic Bible study. Actually, when I was a tent maker, church planter in the Chicago area, I was working at a steel company. And uh, during our lunch hour, we started having Bible study with some of the workers that were not Christians. They had some spiritual interest. And we said, hey, how about if once a week we go off to a table on our own and we'll just read about the life of Jesus. And so during our lunch break, we started having evangelistic Bible study right in the workplace. And so there are a lot of different ways you can do that. And one way that's been developed in the last several years is the so-called Alpha Course. Um, have you heard of the Alpha Course in, in Russia? Some of you have heard of that. 
Um, and that's become especially effective. And I think that there are a number of elements of the Alpha course, again, that speak into certain cultural situations really well. I don't think Alpha would necessarily work everywhere. But there are certain features of Alpha, the Alpha course, that really connects up with contemporary people uh, very well, especially in Western cultural settings. It has a course format, and a lot of people are used to taking courses, whether maybe their job has some sort of continuing education, you've got to go get training for something. So uh, a lot of uh, areas have uh, sort of adult education programs that you can sign up for and take courses, evening courses. And so the Alpha is sort of a course format that people are uh, familiar with. It's uh, basically, its structure is non-confessional. In other words, it's, it's not Catholic, it's not Lutheran, it's, it's sort of a, a general. So if a person uh, is a little concerned about getting involved with some strange sect, well, this is fairly generic. And you begin with that light meal. You know, you, you make it a little friendly, and so you have a meal together. And um, that just creates a warm atmosphere. People like to eat food, right? And, and when you're eating, you're just kind of building relationship. You're not talking necessarily about the topic of the night or anything heavy. You're just building relationship, very relational. And you're building this relationship with Christians, non-Christians. So that helps sort of create a relaxed atmosphere. And then you have the short talk or a video uh, that sort of presents the topic of the night. And there are a number of topics that you go through. Each week is a different topic. And that, that talk sort of launches and presents the information. But the talk is followed up in discussion. Now, here's another element that is uh, very suitable to sort of Western mindset, saying, well, we like to discuss things. You know, don't just tell me something, but, you know, I want to discuss it. I want to process it. And then we talk about it. And especially if I'm not a Christian and somebody says, well, you know, uh, this is the way God is, I might say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Well, that's, you know, so the discussion idea, I'll go back and forth. And there's not going to push you the first week to make some dramatic decision for Christ. It's going to take that process approach. It says, well, you know, the first week, you know, you warm up a little. The next week you learn a little more. And so there's a process involved and we're going to discuss, go back and forth. And of course you have... Uh, there may be a few Christians in the group. You don't want to have too many Christians in one group that will dominate. You want to have several non-Christians that will feel comfortable to ask questions that might, you know, somebody who knows the Bible well might think that's a silly question. And so you have this discussion. You have an alpha weekend where you go off and you have a nice hotel or a retreat place where you go for a weekend and that's relaxed atmosphere. Again, by now, you've been going for several weeks. You, you, you know the people. You've gotten to be friends a little bit. And uh, very often at that Alpha weekend, it's where people do make a commitment to Jesus Christ because they've had several weeks where they're processing the information. They're building relationships. They're saying, well, what does this mean to me? In the beginning, maybe they were more resistant. Now they've warmed up. And the whole process is a 10-week process. So the Alpha course has been uh, sort of tried and tested and developed and uh, proven very effective. Some churches that were having great difficulty with more traditional evangelistic forms, they started an Alpha course. And very often they'll say, well, the first time you do an Alpha course, things are a little slower, might not be as many people that come. But the second time usually works much better. And uh, one of the advantages of Alpha is that, as I say, some churches that have tried more traditional approaches they try the Alpha course, and they get excited. And they're seeing people come to Christ uh, that they haven't seen for a long time. And it mobilizes a lot of people in the church because you got to have somebody who prepares the meals. Of course, you want to have the tables decorated nicely. You can do this in a home. You can do it in a church. You can do it in a restaurant. You can do it in neutral places. So um, the idea is you get a lot of people involved and um, a lot of churches have had very uh, effective uh, experience with the Alpha concept. And there's other courses that are similar to Alpha uh, that have basically the same kind of structure and concept. Uh, they have slightly different topics and uh, a different name, but it's the same basic idea.
Another approach to evangelism that has become really quite developed in the last decade or two is what we call orality and Bible storying. And uh, we speak today of cultures that are primarily oral cultures. That is to say, in many cases, the people are not literate or semi-literate. Remember we said they're functionally illiterate, they just don't read, um, but they're storytelling cultures. And of course, everybody likes a good story. You know, even if you're a very literate culture, everybody likes a good story. Um, and, but the main idea here is that the primary form of communication is not just having somebody read a book or a very uh, you know, Bible study where you're, you're having to read texts a lot, but you're using oral forms of communication. Some people are saying that even many Western cultures are sort of reverting to become more oral. Even though we're very proficient at reading and writing, we still like the good story. We still are much more visually through the internet and YouTube and television and all of this, we become much more visual, much more oral in our approaches. And so uh, whether it's a very traditional culture, um, tribal cultures where people have long-standing oral traditions, or whether they're contemporary cultures, the whole idea of Bible storying. And like the title says, you just tell Bible stories. And there's a lot of great advantages to the whole Bible storing approach. For one, by telling Bible stories, you're using a very concrete approach to explaining who Christ is and the whole salvation history. Sometimes we've taken a very abstract approach. Uh, some of you have probably heard of the four spiritual laws. You know, this was a great tool for evangelism, but you know, the four spiritual laws are kind of abstract. A law is an abstract thing. Some people live in cultures where law is not, not a very reliable thing. <laughs> Even the government does not uh, pay much attention to law. Um, but some of the approaches we've had are very abstract. And by telling Bible stories, it becomes very concrete. And people can relate to that better in many cultures. Another thing is, it's easy for people to reproduce. They can go tell stories the way they've heard them. In other words, I've heard a good story, I can go tell a good story. Of course, we do that with jokes all the time, don't we? Of course, I always forget the way to tell the, the joke right, and it's not very funny. But if you're good at this, you, anybody can learn how to tell a story, right? So when I share the gospel with this person, this person may become a Christian. It's very easy for them to just tell the stories to somebody else, right? Very easy to reproduce. You don't need a lot of fancy materials. You don't need a computer or PowerPoint. You don't even need a book. You just tell the stories. And um, another advantage to the uh, orality Bible storying approach is the whole idea of uh, what we call chronological Bible storying, the chronological approach, where you literally start with Genesis, start with the creation. Who is God? Who are the angels? Who's Satan? Who, are, who is man, Adam and Eve? How, what is sin? This is the fall. And how does God resolve that? And you go all the way through the story, through Abraham, the call of Abraham and Israel. You go through temple, animal sacrifices, all the way through to Jesus. And by doing this, what you do is by telling this long story of the Bible, you're actually building a Christian worldview. You're building a view of who God is, of what sin is, but you're not doing that abstractly by sort of giving a dictionary definition or a theological definition of sin. You're telling the story of sin. You're telling the story of how God relates to man. You're telling the story of how God has a solution for sin. And so it's a very concrete, and you build that whole Christian worldview. See, one of the problems with some approaches to evangelism is sort of start with Jesus. Why did Jesus need to die? Why did Jesus need to shed his blood? That doesn't make sense. And who's God? If you have a Hindu view of God, God's not really a personal God. Now, there's lesser gods. They're more personal. But God is sort of a world soul. So even your view of God, your view of creation. Many cultures have different ideas of creation. Many cultures say sin is really just, you know, not keeping a rule. But in the Bible, sin is much more. So by having this chronological Bible storing approach, you really build that Christian worldview 
by telling all these stories. And then when you get to Jesus, it makes sense why Jesus died. It makes sense how God loves us. It makes sense how God forgives sin. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. And um, some of the materials that are available, perhaps the most famous is called Building on Firm Foundations. New Tribes Missions developed this. Uh, they actually have a whole series of books. Uh, the original form of this was roughly 50 lessons. So it took a while to get through all those lessons, but literally from creation all the way to salvation in Christ. Um, it's been tested, it's been translated into many languages. You can go online and access some of those materials or order those materials. They have uh, visual aids, you know, pictures that you can order that go with the Bible stories to help uh, make that more visual. And so uh, the Firm Foundations was really developed in the Philippines, again, with a very oral culture um, and uh, has been developed for many different languages and contexts. The International Mission Board of the Southern Baptists have also developed many, many materials in uh, orality and Bible storying. Uh, this is just an example of a book, Making Disciples of Oral Learners. And again, some of these resources are available in other languages. You can go online. Some of it you can just download online. Some of it you may have to order, but there's a lot of resources on the whole approach to telling Bible stories. Or you can even get one of these uh, Bible story uh, uh, cloths, and you can sort of see from, from this picture here that uh, there's little pictures. Each box has a different picture, and you can just sort of tell the story with, with the cloth, and that's sort of your sort of a gospel tract of sorts. You can fold it up, carry it around with you, and, and then uh, if somebody else wants it, well, he can have his cloth and he can go tell his stories also. Very simple way, very easily reproducible. Remember what we were saying. If you want church multiplication, you've got to multiply disciples, and you have to have methods that are easily reproducible. So this whole idea, the whole area of uh, orality and Bible storing is, again, something we can't go into in a lot more detail. Um, you can see videos on this at YouTube that will give you lessons on how to do some of this. So that would be something, especially if you're dealing with people who are uh, less literate or in traditional societies, um, but even in more sophisticated societies, this is becoming more and more uh, approach that's being used. 